Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Gannon, an account manager at CSD, and welcome to today's Learning Lab Live session. I'd like to introduce Dr. Brad Hogan, who is one of our immunoprecipitation experts at cell signaling technology. Today we're going to discuss using co-immunoprecipitation to validate protein-protein interactions with both endogenous and tagged protein models. During today's sessions, you have the opportunity to ask questions by typing them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the CST Learning Lab Live session on immunoprecipitation. Without further ado, I'll turn this over to our IP expert, Dr. Brad Hogan. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. First, I'd like to provide a quick outline of the topics I'll cover today. A brief introduction and general overview of IP and co-IP workflows followed by a run through of important experimental considerations at each step of these workflows. I'll then pivot to focus on approaches involving tag proteins and those targeting proteins with post-translational modifications. So immunoprecipitation or IP is a powerful and important tool for research. IP is a technique used to enrich or purify a specific protein or protein complex from an extract, leveraging the specificity of an antibody. What are the experimental endpoints with IP? First, IP can be used to enrich for a protein, if your protein is expressed at low levels, or purify a protein for use in a downstream activity assay, ELISA, or proteomics application. CoIP is used to probe and validate protein interactions. Using this method, the protein of interest is IP'd, and one can then, either by Western blot or mass spec, verify proteins that co-migrate with the protein of interest. IP can also be used to investigate post-translational modifications or alterations to protein activity after treatment with a chemical modulator. Broader application of IP using antibodies targeting protein sequence motifs are valuable for expression pro profiling and proteomics. Briefly, let's go through a general IP co-IP workflow. A primary antibody is incubated with a cell extract containing a protein complex of interest. The antibody will recognize a specific epitope and bind to that protein, in effect precipitating complexes from the sample. Beads that bind the FC region of the antibody are added, incubated, and either magnetic or centrifuge separated to purify the precipitated complexes. The final step can then vary based on research endpoint. For the next series of slides, I will focus on important considerations in this workflow. The choice of model system, cell lysis and preclear steps, primary antibody and bead incubations, and secondary detection. Much of the heavy lifting for a good IP experiment occurs up front and before one even enters the lab. Determining the best model system to use for experiments is crucial. Some great online resources for researching protein expression in cell lines, tissues, and species, details about cell lines, protein interactions, and post-translational modifications can be found at the link shown here. The choice of cell lysis buffer is important and depends greatly on what types of proteins you're IPing, as well as cell line and tissues used. Standard cell lysis buffer is frequently used when preparing samples for Western blot or IP. However, given particular cell types and tissues, sometimes using this buffer for IP may result in a higher background and nonspecific protein binding. Being less stringent, however, this buffer is less likely to inhibit kinase activity and disrupt protein complexes. As a more stringent lysis buffer, RIPA generally results in lower background but can denature some kinases and potentially disrupt protein-protein interactions. RIPA enables rapid, efficient lysis and solubilization of proteins from adherent cultured cells and tissues. I often recommend this buffer when working with difficult tissues or if one is investigating nuclear lo localized proteins. Given the time constraints here, I won't go into much detail regarding fractionation. There are many good uh, protocols available online. CST does offer a great cell fractionation kit for cytoplasmic, nuclear, and membrane fraction protein isolation. With all lysis buffers, I would strongly encourage addition of supplements such as PMSF, protease, and phosphatase inhibitors to stabilize protein integrity and post-translational modifications. The choice of primary antibody is crucial. The antibody used should be validated for IP and show specificity for the protein of interest. IP protocols are often painstakingly validated by the manufacturer. I would refer to their instructions as to the recommended methodology for use. 
The most commonly used IgG binding proteins are protein A and protein G, which bind to the FC part of the antibody. Each have varying affinities depending on species and antibody isotype. Quite generally, rabbit IgGs are bound with good affinity by protein A. Protein G has high affinity for mouse IgG1 and is optimal for use with mouse antibodies. A great summary table is available to help determine bead choice at NEB's webpage. The link is here for your reference. In addition, one should determine the bead type to use. Generally, there are two types. Agarose beads have a main advantage in that they show very little nonspecific binding. The advantages of magnetic beads are that there is a shorter incubation time, no need for multiple centrifugation steps as the supernatant is easy to remove during washes, and they're easily scalable for higher throughput applications. A critical step in IP experiments that we are often asked about by customers is dealing with IgG masking. When performing IP, in addition to the target protein, the antibody itself is isolated from the experiment. One will then observe molecular weight bands of 55 and 25 kilodalton created respectively by the heavy and light chains. The heavy and light chain bands will mask the detection of any target proteins or protein that you co ip at those respective molecular weights. Fortunately, there are several methods to work around masking. The first is to simply use a primary or secondary antibody of a different species than the IP antibody when Western blocking. However, an antibody from a different species is not always readily available. For proteins greater than 30 kilodalton, one can use a light chain specific secondary antibody. These only bind the light chain and would only result in an IgG band observed at 25 kilodalton. Another option is to use a confirmation specific secondary antibody. These only recognize IgG in the native confirmation and therefore will not recognize denatured IgG. Neither 55 or 25 kilodalton bands will be observed when using this antibody for Western blot detection after IP. Lastly, one can use a protein A or G HRP conjugated antibody. Like most secondary antibodies, protein A and protein G HRP bind the FC portion of the primary antibody. But unlike most secondaries, which also bind denatured heavy and light chain on Western blot, these antibodies bind only intact IgG. Consequently, one will observe clean and specific signals corresponding to the protein of interest. Here are a few examples of IP avoiding masking. In panel one, IP was performed for the transcription factor ERF3 in MCF7 breast cancer cells using a rabbit monoclonal antibody. The Western blot detection was performed using a mouse monoclonal antibody for ERF3. In panel two, P105, P50, and a kappa B1 protein was IP'd in Raji lymphoblast cells using a rabbit monoclonal antibody. A light chain specific antibody was used for detection. In panel three, gasdermin D, a key protein involved in pyroptosis, was IP'd from THP1 cells and detected using a confirmation specific antibody. In panel four, the proapoptotic protein BIM which has three lower molecular weight isoforms, was IP'd from mouse A20 lymphoma cells and detected using a protein A HRP uh, secondary antibody. Many protein preparations in research are done through tagged expression vectors. These tags enable easy purification of expressed proteins. A key aspect of using tagged proteins the ability, is the ability to work with protein targets for which there might not be any primary antibody available. Shown in the table are the most commonly used peptide tags. When using a tag protein, several considerations must be addressed. The location of the tag should be in frame and not result in an epitope being masked. It should also not disrupt protein structure, function, and interaction, and not hinder any protein activity affecting downstream applications and activity assays. Lastly, I would add a few comments about IP when working with post-translationally modified proteins. Most frequently, PTMs are the result in treatment with uh, are the result of treatment with chemical modulators. Treatment may need to be optimized for your experiments. In addition, make sure to use an antibody specific to the modification. Two important controls when pursuing this type of experiment. I would recommend performing IP using either an untreated control sample or detection with a total antibody. 
Shown here is an IP performed with a phosphostat-6 antibody specific for phosphorylated tyrosine-641 using ACHN cells with no treatment at left and treated with the cytokine IL-4, a well-characterized inducer for phosphorylation of STAT-6. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today, and I hope all this information was helpful and informative for your research. At this time, I would like to open up for any questions. Thank you, Brad, that was great. Looks like we do have several questions. Um, the first is, what are the best strategies and tips for using IP to identify more transient protein complexes or complexes containing nucleic acids like RNA? So I think one of the most important considerations with that kind of with a, tr a transient complex is that they're not quite as, as stable. So you would probably have to think about the cell lysis step up front, um, probably use a mild, milder detergent, um, probably use a, a less invasive disruption to create your cell extract. Um, I'd also uh, advise paying attention to the localization of where the uh, transient complex, where the complex is uh, localized in the cell, um, because it may be necessary to use some sort of fractionation methodology to, um, to, to enrich for that those complexes. Okay. Next question is, what is the best way to go about performing IP for proteins that have extensive PTMs like glycosylation, sumoylation, et cetera? Um, so there's a, there's a couple there's a couple points here. Um, one, I would, again, I would focus on the cell lysis step. So um, upstream of, of, of any detection method. So um, with your cell lysis step, uh, again, use probably use a little bit more of a milder cell lysis uh, buffer. Um, and then I think most important is the detection step downstream. So glycosylated proteins will usually run in general as like a uh, kind of a, either a smear or a series of like a spread out molecular weight based on how glycosylated they are. Um, and that could really run the risk of uh, masking. You could you could have some masking issues. So I I would strongly recommend like a some sort of anti-masking strategy like a HRP antibody or a confirmation specific antibody. Um, if the downstream application isn't so important, um, there's a couple of upstream methods you could you could enzymatically treat with um, a, a, you know like a deglycosylase enzyme like PNGase or some sort of uh, sumoylation you know removal enzyme like um, ULP1 that um, that would result in a, a much tighter molecular weight band running on your Western blot, but um, that might not necessarily, that might be going a little too far. Um, it, it's basically just if you're having a lot of trouble detecting it, mm -hmm. that might be an option. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how do I best address variability between IP experiments? Okay. Uh, so a few things about variability between experiments. Um, so it starts with your cell extract um, I would I would definitely uh, focus on a uniform num number of cells uh, probably quantitate the protein so that you have the same amount of cells protein it, you know, make it uniform up front um, you could also focus on the antibody the primary antibody for IP um, I know there's a lot of uh, opinions about polyclonal antibodies versus monoclonal antibodies and, and how effective or how good they are for IP applications, but generally monoclonal antibody batch to batch is very consistent. And so if you're looking for consistency, I probably would recommend a, a monoclonal product um, in that, you know, batch to batch polyclonals might vary slightly. Um, I think that's, I'm trying to think if there's another, yeah, I, I think the cell cell number, protein quantification, and, and, um, and using a monoclonal, probably like the three best strategies there. Okay, thank you. Um, how do I perform IP using difficult tissue extracts, for example, adipose tissue? Yeah, we get a lot of, we get a lot of uh, questions from customers based on, um, you know, usually the, that's one of the things I zero in on when we get a tech form back from customers, their, their cell line or their tissue, uh, tissue particularly. Um, so tissues can run the gamut from like, you can have adipose tissue, you could have skeletal muscle, you could have cardiac muscle tissue, you know, uh, skin, like the tissues present some some difficulty in terms of, um, I think the most important thing is to 
really do the work up front, look through the recommended cell lysis protocols for those particular type of tissues. Um, there may be a little bit of a requirement for some sort of pre-processing, like you may have to, like I know with adipose tissue, it's extremely lipid containing. So you might have to separate out that lipid component from the protein component before you go on into your IP reaction. Um, and so there's a little bit of a trade-off between the amount of upfront processing, the cell lysis buffer, and how you go about your IP. But um, you know, generally, the if you do your homework and look through the literature, look online for you know some maybe some vendors have very you know specifically formulated cell lysis buffers, or some there's you know there's a formula that might work really well for a particular type of tissue. I would I would pursue that. Okay. Um, what strategies do you have for IPing from concentrated condition cell media? So what I would, uh, um, so a lot of condition cell media, um, usually we, our, our group deals with a lot of like secreted, uh, secreted proteins um, and they're very tricky to work with. Um, I would generally recommend trying to, it's a little bit of a trade-off, try to make as concentrated uh, samples you can. However, if you do this, it might increase background. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. But I would I would err on the side of being very concentrated or as, as concentrated as you can get it. Um, and then the pre-clear step is probably not quite as huge a deal um, with these because you're I feel like the more you are handling the sample up front, um, these secreted or you know, usually they're processed or cleaved or before secretion and they're time isn't on your side or or the number of steps you use up front isn't on your side so you don't want to have any degradation so generally the trade-off is a little bit less processing concentrate more and then maybe skip the pre-clear step with that just to be um, to be on the safe side um, you might invite more non-specific background but you won't run the risk of degrading samples down the line all right Oh, this next one I've had happen. So what do you recommend doing when the negative control also shows a band by Western blot? And what if the IgG band is stronger than your sample? Oh, yeah. Um, so I always will go back to sort of like the first principles of a, of a good IP experiment. I will check the, um, if you run, it's very important every IP experiment run I, IgG only, uh, use an, a non-specific IgG only IP. Um, so that will tell you if there's some general level. It, it, it might happen there's some general level of non-specific interaction that you might just pull protein because it just binds to like any antibody. So maybe some basal level of that. Um, I also recommend doing just a beads only reaction with your lysate, just because sometimes, especially with agarose beads, they'll get there's a little bit of a stickiness to that uh, to them, and you know might. You might pull a little bit non-specific or you know of your, of your target using that. Um, I'd also double check to the sometimes it's an artifact of the expression. So if you're using, I know I just recommended using like pretty high expression samples or whatever, but sometimes it's like so high in expression that you're just swamping, you know, everything through, and you may you might not be able to wash out all of the endogenous this humongous amount of endogenous protein. Um, so, so I think if you have your 10% input, your beads only in your IgG, um, if you see like enrichment, um, it might not be as huge a concern. I wouldn't immediately leap to the conclusion that maybe the antibody is not specific or you're, you're getting, the, I, I think it's sometimes there's just a stickiness component of the antibody, the beads, um, and then the endogenous ex expression is very high sometimes. Um, next one is, is it possible to detect a viral protein with a protein receptor located in the membrane using IP? Yeah, it, it definitely is. And then I would, I would say it's, this question is a little bit of the, a little bit of the flip side of the question earlier about the transient complexes, right? In that um, generally viral proteins have a pretty good interaction with the membrane receptor that they're binding to. Um, I think we've seen that all with the, the SAR, the, the, variant strain of SARS that's, it's, that's much more infectious, it's because it binds quite tightly uh, based on just a single amino acid substitution. Um, so you're dealing with a pretty inherently stable complex. Um, and I would just kind of follow along, um, you know, the general recommended IP protocol. And then I would also maybe look into, um, 
I know if you're just interested in the viral protein binding in the membrane, you might want to think about a fractionation methodology. Um, and if you're already there, you could fractionate nuclear fraction and cytosol because I know, you know, in terms of viral infection, right, usually virus gets into cells, hijacks the cellular machine, machinery. So there might be some down, some alternate experiments you could do just simply having a fractionation kit to, you know, you could look at the membrane fraction, but then you've got the cytosolic or nuclear fraction in your, in your pocket afterwards. Um, how do you quantify IP results other than by Western blotting? That's this is a tough one. Um, so it, there's a lot of you can Western blotting isn't super quantitative. You can make it about as quantitative as you can get. Um, I generally you could do a um, like a known protein concentration, maybe titrate it, and just see like the the band intensity, and then in reference to your samples, you could also um, you could also normalize to maybe some RNA, RNA expression data. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's a, a, a technique that might be a little bit more quantitative than just looking at band intensity. Um, you could also take the quant of the protein up front and then make sure to like track that through. You know, you use like 200 micrograms of protein, we get this intense intensity band and it corresponds to this. Um, generally, there's no great ironclad way to to go about it um, after you've done IP um, but that's about as close as I can you know as good as I can recommend uh, for, okay. for right now. All right. In IP how can you be sure that a monoclonal antibody is not binding only to a subpopulation of the target? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I suppose you could so let's see I suppose you could refer back to that, uh, the FC table, right? Um, and so that table will show you if, let's say protein A, you know, you're, you're, you're coming at with a monoclonal antibody um, that you can, you can then go back and look and see if there's some sort of affinity other than, you know, what, it, and so if you have like a, a different type of bead, do you, do you still pull down based on, based on that? You could, you could try that. Um, Generally, though, um, I haven't had any any issues with the, uh, the, a different isotype of a monoclonal antibody having issues with specificity. Um, usually, that's usually the monoclonals are pretty uniform batch to batch. Okay. What methods are the best for IPing with embryonic lysates that have a huge amount of ribosomes and yolk proteins? Oh man, yeah. So. That's a really good, that's also a really good question. I mean, I think it goes back to the difficult tissue mm -hmm. answer there in terms of, you know, like a yolk, that's a very high lipid component again, right? Um, I think you're, there might be some, you're already probably doing this if you're, if you're pursuing that, that model system for your experiment, you're probably already doing quite a bit of upstream pre-processing of your sample. Um, I would probably try to at least isolate away as much non-protein component um, from your sample as you can before you go downstream to, to IPing with your protein sample. Um, so I, I think it goes back a little bit along the same lines as the adipose tissue mm -hmm. angle, right? And that you should probably try and get rid of those lipids that are in the, the yolk portion of your, of your sample. Right. Um, do you have any tips for RNA IP? We have been struggling with a great amount of background and very low yield of mRNA. Uh, yeah, so RNA, so RNA IP is a little bit tricky because you want to, you want to isolate. Uh, it, first of all, the RNA protein comp can be a little bit transient. It's not quite as like stable as some other uh, RNA inherently isn't quite as stable as other nucleic acids. Like you know, if you're doing a chip assay. Um, but what I would, I would, I would start with probably a. A more gentle lysis and then maybe work your way up if you want to go to more stringent lysis buffers if you if you see a lot of non-specific background if you see um, some deg degradation and I would definitely not recommend uh, like a very vigorous lysis you want to kind of um, basically make sure that the cytosolic fraction in particular is uh, left kind of in a good state where you have the proteins bound to your transcripts and then can go downstream with your IP. Um, they do, 
you know, with more stringent buffers, you can get at some of the pro some of the RNA that might be in the nucleus, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, so there could be, you know, it's like everything with this, with a lot of scientific techniques. With each step, there's some trade-offs and some, you know, there's some pros and cons and some trade-offs with each step. Um, so if you use a gentle lysis buffer, you know, you might miss out on some of those nuclear localized RNA binding uh, proteins. But um, I, I think if you start there and kind of work your way more more towards the stringency, I think that's probably a good strategy. Um, and then, I, you know, you might also want to consider just a, a, a fractionation kit. So you can yeah. fra get your cytosolic fraction and maybe your nuclear fraction and just focus on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is it much more challenging to precipitate the endogenous protein more than the overexpressed tag protein? Is there any method to increase the chance of pulling down the endogenous protein? Um, usually a lot of times when, I, when I've worked with tag proteins or protein constructs, I try to use a cell, ex I, I would recommend using a cell extract that has very little or zero endogenous expression because you just don't want that contamination so i know that like 293 you know 293 hela there's there's a lot of like a who's who of transfected extracts that that are used i, I would just always double check that they don't have some sort of endogenous level of expression of you know your your tagged construct um in terms of the differences between isolating endogenous and isolating tag protein it's not too different. Um, it's the tag protein. Sometimes the overexpression will make a like very large amount of protein in your sample. Um, that so it might swamp your Western blot detection detection a little bit, like downstream. But in general, the principles are pretty pretty similar. Um, if you have a high endogenous expression line and then an overexpression line, the dynamics are pretty similar. Um, I I think the best warning I can get or a you know, piece of advice I could give is that um, I would definitely, if you're doing a transfection, just to save you any kind of headaches, um, just try to get a, a cell in that has very little or zero endogenous expression of whatever protein you're looking at that you're going to tag. Okay. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you do have other questions about IP, feel free to contact us at support at cellsignal.com and Dr. Hogan will get your email or one of our other product scientists. Um, thank you so much. I hope this was helpful and have a great rest of your day.